The canyons are a series of underwater abysses formed where the continental shelf drops off into the continental slope, creating miles of deep water that attract tuna, swordfish, marlin, and other big fish. Because of its distance from shore, a trip to the canyons is a serious undertaking, requiring planning and effort to make the nearly four-hour journey. As they had been on past trips, these seasoned fishermen were full of excitement as they loaded their gear and began the trip. This year, they would try something new, using an offshore racing boat rigged for fishing. A promising forecast was issued by the Weather Service, and it was all systems go as they left the harbor, traveling at racing speed into an uncertain fate. In spite of the best laid plans, about 35 miles out, something went terribly wrong. The U.S. Coast Guard receives a mayday call at 7.59 a.m. Only one coordinate is given before the connection is cut off. At 7.59 a.m., it will be over 10 hours before anyone begins to wonder where they are. Barbara Jones, one of the wives of the fishermen, knows her husband well. Dave always calls me to let me know he's safe. But I also know, even if he says he's going to be home by dark and the fish are biting, that don't even expect him home because he's going to, he's going to fish to the last possible second and then he'll come home. But Dave's not coming home today. And as the hours pass, Barbara knows something is wrong. So I called the Coast Guard, and I didn't have the name of the boat. I didn't have any information. I didn't even know how many guys really went with him. They informed me that they had a boat go down at 7.59. He was sure that that was the boat my husband was on, that they had gone down. And I think it was then that I just, it was one of those times that you just can't even function. I, I remember sitting on the bed, I had the phone in my hand, and I just, I couldn't think. I was numb because I, I didn't know what to think. A group of New Jersey fishermen failed to return after a day trip to the renowned canyons. The Coast Guard responded to an incomplete mayday call and has been searching the area ever since early morning. Meanwhile, an incredible drama is unfolding at sea. Everyone was thrilled to be there. They expected a glorious day of fishing for big tuna when a short circuit and a rogue wave changed their plans. Dave Jones, a survivor, recalls the events. I saw the bow of the boat down and a wave probably three foot above the bow. The next thing I know, I turn my back to avoid getting wet and it felt like a Volkswagen hitting me. The next thing Dave noticed was silence. The engines had cut out. The boat was taking on more water with every wave. There was no panic. It was just guys doing what had to be done. We were ripping out seats. We grabbed a flare gun. In a few short minutes, there was no choice but to abandon ship. They leapt into the water, just in time to watch in disbelief as the boat disappeared beneath them. You're in blue water and uh, big fish are out there. Sharks were always in the back of your mind. The men were surprisingly composed in the aftermath, floating on a cooler and a few life vests, trying to process the magnitude of their situation when one of them spots a helicopter on the horizon. We had a Coast Guard helicopter sighting and we shot two flares off. Devastatingly, the flares went unseen. They would not be rescued quickly. A sense of foreboding took hold as they formulated a plan for survival. They would stay as a group and try to swim towards land and hopefully into boat traffic. We all sit out as a group and between the waves and the wind, we got separated maybe 100 feet apart from each other. Now they were in two groups. Their chances of survival just decreased. 
Joe Walls recalls what happened next to him and Dave. I knew we were drifting pretty quick. There's nothing to judge it against. There's no point of that you can look at and say, well, you went past that quickly. But I knew we were moving fast. After swimming and floating for hours, Dave spots a lobster pot marker in the late afternoon. If you really think about what a lobster pot area is, it's, it's just a stick with a flag and foam and a line going down to the lobster pot. It wasn't much, but they grab hold and secure themselves with their belts. During the remaining hours of daylight, the pair watches as a helicopter flies a search pattern tantalizingly nearby, but never comes within range of the men. So as the night went on, Joe and I uh, told each other our life stories. We came to the fact that we were probably going to die out there. We were exhausted. Our bodies were giving up. I could feel my body dying. Even as they drift in and out of consciousness and fight off debilitating convulsions brought on by the cold, they wonder about the fate of the friends they had separated from. I kept wondering what, what happened to them. But I assumed at that point that they were still drifting. At 35 miles from shore, clinging to a lobster pot is the only chance of survival. And incredibly, in the vast Atlantic Ocean, their friends, Art and Thomas, had found a lobster pot of their own. We had lost sight of Dave, of Dave and Joe hours before. We had no idea where they were. We were worried about them. Now in complete exhaustion, they hold on in desperation. At midnight is when it, it dawned on me that I actually said, you know, I might die out here. I admitted to myself. That's when I first admitted it. And um, almost a calm came over me. But out of that calm resolve comes some very big excitement. We were watching all the cargo vessels farther out on the horizon. You could see their lights. Their light configuration was long and like this. You could see lights up and down the length of the ship, and they were going up and down the coast all night long, but they were so far out, there was no chance of making contact. About 1 o'clock in the morning, I looked up, and I saw a set of lights that didn't look like the other lights. A massive tanker is headed directly towards them. As blind as I am, I, can, I could see detail on the side of the ship. It was so close, of scale, rust, and this thing was gliding by. We're screaming, help, help! in unison. Help! We would go, one, two, three, help! help. You know, and we saw portholes open. We didn't see anybody. Help! Help! Then, out on the rear deck, they see a single figure smoking a cigarette. We gave one more yell of help, and his head snapped around. I thought he gave himself whiplash, and he dropped his cigarette and he took off running. And uh, then we heard all the commotion on the boat. They put other lights on. The Taiwanese tanker lowers a lifeboat, and against all odds, the men are soon safely inside the ship. Just a short distance away, lashed to a lobster pot in the light of a full moon, Dave and Joe have witnessed the miraculous rescue of their friends. They know that this ship is their only chance. And the next thing we know, the ship had stopped broadside to us, and we could uh, actually see a uh, motor whaleboat being lowered from the tanker. And we started screaming. We found energy that we never knew we had. On board the tanker, Art hears his friend's cries. He directs a nearby Coast Guard helicopter to fly into the moonlight in the direction of the voices. And the helicopter pretty much came right out, found us. It was indescribable, the sounds of the engines and the lights, the water lit up underneath us and the mist in the air. Soon, these fortunate fishermen were all rescued and on their way home with an amazing story of survival. There's no such thing as I on a team, and uh, that's the way we went through the whole ordeal. I think if Joe slipped off that lobster pot, I'd have been right behind him, and if I slipped off, he would have been right behind me. If I were an odds maker, I, I wouldn't have given us odds. We shouldn't be here. So many things happened during that day. If one of those things had changed, we would not be here. <laughs>